Welcome to Haunted Hospitality, Southern Stories Told by Spooky Gingers. I'm Robin. And I'm Zoe. Zoe, what is your something Southern? Actually, Zoe, what is a something Southern? All right. Yes, that is a great question, Robin. <laughs> la la la. Um, so our first episode was the previous episode. That, Shocker. Yes, <laughs> because this is the second episode. Oh, my God. What? Yeah. And so uh, we didn't have the something southern because we were the something southern we did talk a lot about the south which is a goal yeah and us yeah but we were introducing ourselves we wanted to make sure people knew who they were listening to uh but so moving forward to kind of like uh move us into the podcast so we don't immediately start saying hello my name is zoe and i'm going to freak you out because i'm talking about death I think my um, goal is to just freak people out okay. with this podcast, not in my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so we're going to talk about something Southern. Mm-hmm. Uh, this can be a wide variety of things. Maybe one day we'll try Southern foods. Um, oh, gosh. We'll we talk- should probably do a lot of Southern food ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm... I'm mm. Uh, well, yeah, so we can do Southern foods, Southern sayings, Southern places, just something Southern. Uh, right now, we're sitting down and drinking our strawberry lemonade sweet teas. Yes. Yes, even though I'm allergic to strawberry lemonade. She is allergic to everything like fruity, acidic, yep. red. Yep. And it stresses me out because she just drinks it and eats it in front of me. Yep. And I'm like, well, you know, I hope you survive when I leave. You know, I was sick last night because I was eating jelly beans. But like I told my mother this morning, I will die before I stop eating jelly beans. That might actually come true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but anyway, something Southern is not my acidic intolerance. Well, then Zoe, what is your something Southern? So for something Southern... I think we should talk about uh, a southern place that we have been to or would like to go to once the pandemic is over Ooh. or potentially would like to learn more about. Okay. So my place is a place that I'm going to pronounce incorrectly because the locals hate the way I say it. I've come a long way. It's New Orleans. Yes, I know. I used to pronounce it New Orleans. That's not why I made that face. And I know the locals call it, like, Nolens or something like that. Why are you making a face? I'll tell you later. No, no, just say it. My place was New Orleans. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, how about this? We both can talk about why we want to go to New Orleans. Hey, Zoe, we both want to go to New Orleans when the pandemic is over. Group trip! But, yeah, I want to go to New Orleans. Um, New Orleans. New Orleans, um, because so Robin and I are both English people, as in. What do you mean by that? As in, I have a bachelor's in English, and you oh, have yeah. a bachelor's and a master's, and well, you have a bachelor's in English and a master's in creative writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So my goal is, I would love to go go to New Orleans. Um, live in the suburbs for three years, learn the culture, learn everything about it, and write a book that takes place in New Orleans. Because I feel like the culture, the atmosphere, the spookiness is just something I'm drawn to, Mm -hmm. and I would love to go there one day. So, your answer is a lot more in-depth than mine. Okay. Wait, so have you ever been to New Orleans? No. No. Okay, so I, I, I asked her mid sip. I like to do that to people. <laughs> um, so I went to New Orleans once over, like, just before Christmas when I was 15 years old. Okay. Here is what happened. Oh, no. I discovered Ed Sheeran on the way down. Oh, no. And just, I was just listening to the A-team the entire time. I was listening to it in the shower as we're driving anywhere. Uh-huh. So... Ed Sheeran and New Orleans are inextricably connected (laughs) in my mind. But here's some other things I would like to do. I would like to go to Café du Monde again. So, okay, Okay. do you know what Café du Monde is? I I know what Café du Monde is. For those who don't know what Café du Monde is, they have... A.K. like five people in the world. 
They have great beignets. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows about their beignets. Okay, fine. Anyway, normally, it seems, the line is, like, around the block for Café du Monde. Right. I went in the off-season. Oh, genius. Well, I didn't. It was planned. Okay. I, I was 15, so And we... so when's the off-season? Is it just not Mardi Gras? December. Okay. During break. I went there, and so we just um, were immediately sat, and I had a chocolate milk, and I had beignets, and there were little birdies at my feet, because we were, like, outside. Okay. It was, like, a tent thing. And Zoe was just delicious. I enjoyed it so much. It brought me such joy. Now, unfortunately, last time I went to New Orleans, I was 15, so just, like, bear with me. Right. I was discovering, like, the joys of shopping. Oh, no. And so I just spent a lot of time trying to think about what I would buy in New Orleans, when really, I wish I had gone on cool tours. We did go to cool restaurants, so there's that, but I wish I had gone on cool tours. And, I mean, like, talk about a spooky trip somewhere. Right. New Orleans is the thing, and I did not do a ghost story there, because I also went with, like, part of my family who might not have been super into a ghost story as well. Right. Um, But... I would love to go. There's a vampire tour, and I remember my cousin, she kind of was, like, I think making fun of, like, the goth people on the the, (laughs) the vampire tour, so she had me stand in front of her camera, so it wouldn't look like she was taking a photo of them. Oh, my God. But the flash was on, so I just got a bright flash (laughs) in my face, and I'm like, I want to go on the tour. (laughs) Um, But anyway... Well, you loved know, her, loved the trip, okay. loved everything about it. Uh, that was just a fun little tidbit. But um, I would love to go to New Orleans and have a spooky New Orleans trip that also focused on beignets. Yes, That's beignets and ghosts. Yeah. Well, you know, there's like part of the city where taxi drivers aren't allowed to pick up anybody because there's been a genuine issue where they will pick up people and start driving them to their location and they'll disappear from the back seat because they just picked up a fucking ghost. What? Yes. Oh, my God. Legitimate policy of these taxi cab companies is that you cannot pick up anybody from these areas at night because you're going to pick up a ghost. I love this. Yes. That's how, like, ingrained ghosts are. Like, if you go to New Orleans and you ask a local, not, like, some other tourist, boo tourists, um, if you go and ask a local, do you believe in ghosts? They're going to be like, do you believe in the sun? You know, like, mm-hmm. it's... Granted, I'm generalizing, and I probably shouldn't generalize, but it's ingrained in the culture there. Yeah. So, and also, I want to go to a voodoo shop. <laughs> also, the street musicians. Yes, the street musicians and the food. I had jambalaya my first night there. It was great. <laughs> and, like, like um, I've seen, like, a lot of, like, reenactments mm-hmm. of years before where they like will show you how people lived in new orleans back in like the 1800s and Mm -hmm. it's just so fascinating because they use the same language which is what what do you mean oh oh, like like it's a different language than i have a hard time understanding english i had no idea what these people were speaking (laughs) and so um not that i've seen it myself i've seen youtube videos and stuff like that but It's just, it's a place I really want to go to. Awesome. Well. Zoe. Yes. Do you have a ghost story for us? No. Oh, well. Okay, that's that's the the end of the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes, I do. Um, So this is, unlike yours, which was a person, this is a place. Maybe next week we'll do a thing. Just complete all the noun categories. No, no. The fourth episode will have to be an idea. Oh, you know, they didn't mention that to us in elementary school because they didn't want us to think for ourselves. Right, yeah. Yeah. So that was introduced in high school. Mm, I zoned out, I guess. (laughs) Anyway, so yes. um, So my father happens to live in the town that this takes place. So I've seen this area, but I've never been there myself. So wait, can I... Clarification question. Have you looked at it wistfully from a distance yes i was oh, okay i was in a car and i was having one of those like movie montage oh moments where you moments. look out the window and you put your hand against the window and you just looked wistfully while music plays 
And like the other person side eyes you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I've seen this place from a distance. This is, you probably have ho- heard of it, the Biltmore. Man. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh. That makes a lot of, this is something you can wistfully stare at from a distance. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Okay, cool. So those of you who don't know, so this is in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I When I was Googling, I did have to specify North Carolina because there's multiple Biltmore estates because Vanderbilt, um, the man who built it, was fucking rich. And I fucking hate its guts because of it. I'll get into it. But um, so this is one of his many estates. And so this is the one in North Carolina, um, Buncombe County. Okay. Uh, it's right outside of Asheville, technically. So it's the largest privately owned house in the United States. It's about 180,000 square feet. Okay, so for context. A traditional house is about 1,300 square feet. So 1,300. That's a 3-2. At least in South Carolina, because I work in real estate. Um, in South Carolina, a traditional house is... A three-bedroom, two-bath house is 1,300 square feet. So this is... 180,000 square feet. So this is over 100 times the size of a normal house. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's huge. For context, I have been to the Biltmore. Okay. Maybe that... Okay. Okay. I should have, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. And so there's the Biltmore estate, and then there's mm-hmm. the town of Biltmore. Yeah. So, um... The town of Biltmore, I mean, it's not actually called Biltmore. Like, if you're addressing an envelope, you won't put Biltmore in North Carolina. But it's, like, the, uh, basically, when he was building the estate, it was so expensive and resource-heavy in building it that he started a construction company nearby, a lumber company nearby, a steel mill nearby, so he wouldn't have to import everything. Like, I mean, a railroad was built to this location for the building of this specific house. Do we know why he wanted to build it in this area specifically rather than one that would already just, it would not require that much infrastructure change? Yes, we do know. Oh, okay. He came into town several times to visit his mother, and he fell in love with Asheville, and so he decided to build a little mountain escape so that he had somewhere to stay when he was visiting his mother. A little mountain escape? Yes. That requires a new railroad? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is why I fucking hate him. (laughs) Um, But yes, it was built for George Vanderbilt II in 1889 as a vacation home that he didn't spend too much time in, but he did spend some time in there. It's like, because the Biltmore is one of those types of houses that you would more likely see in England. Right. So we don't really have these huge mansions like that right in the u.s not this big not to this scale and not this old and the biltmore estate is like big enough like it has a mcdonald's inside of it i've never seen the mcdonald's inside of it uh, there's a mcdonald's inside of it wow. i was google mapping at mcdonald's and i was like oh let's go to this one and my dad's like no we can't go to that one they charge you ten dollars for a burger that you can get for two dollars at another mcdonald's That's so funny. yeah so he built it as his little mountain escape He had to purchase 700 different parcels of land to be able to build it, including five cemeteries. It was built on top of five cemeteries. I feel like if we're going to learn anything from this podcast, it's that, like, people are going to do whatever they want with the land over your body. Yeah, yeah. Basically, they don't bother to move the bodies. So it was, uh, it took over lots of farms Lots of cemeteries and other houses. So they just tore it all down just so he could have his estate. His little mountain escape. Um, So right now, uh, while in its existence, uh, many famous people stayed there for either a couple months or their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Uh, Louis the 15th, you know, French king person. um, Louis the 15th, he was actually raised there until he was 16. Um, many ambassadors and novelists and U.S. presidents stayed there. So it was, there's a lot of famous people there. And they were famous for having parties every night, essentially. So there was tons of parties almost every single night. 
Um, if you were looking to get down, you'd go to Biltmore Estate. So it's like Gatsby without the insecurity. Right, yeah, yeah. But now it is a tourist attraction. Uh, the house is assessed at $157.2 million. And assessments are usually much lower than the actual value of a house. Just letting you know. Mm-hmm. Another real estate tidbit. <laughs> I also feel like the value of the Biltmore comes from its name recognition too. So I'm sure like it's actually valued a lot of, more above like just what it physically is. Right. Um, and there it's it greets 1.2 million visitors each year. However, it is shut down right now because of COVID. Fun part, when they were building it, because of the ex- extensiveness of it, they had to build secret pathways throughout the entire place so you can go from one room to another quickly. Because otherwise, you'd have to go all the way around the house to get to certain rooms. So um, they have secret passages for the um, staff and all of that. So, like, when you're playing Clue... Yes. And in the corner rooms, there's ways to get to the opposite end of the house. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So, um, it's a really cool building, honestly, as much as I hate Vanderbilt. He did a good job. (laughs) It's a very nice house. Yeah. It feels weird calling it a house. Estate. Yeah. Estate, yeah. Um, so Vanderbilt married Edith Dresser in in 1898 and they had a daughter named Cornelia, and she was born on the estate. Okay. Um, so in 1914, uh, George Vanderbilt passed away unexpectedly on the estate uh, due to an emergency appendectomy. So his appendix burst, and he passed away due to complications from the surgery. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so after he passed, so they were already working, so they were kind of losing money. And so they were planning on selling the grounds to the government, essentially. Um, but it was still a negotiation before he pa- when he passed. And so Edith, his wife, uh, she finalized things after he died because all of a sudden she had to manage all of this. And so she ended up selling more than they had originally planned. Yeah. So she sold 87,000 acres. Yeah. Uh, all the Biltmore Estate Industries, that's the steel mill, the um, forestry, like all of the things that they built to build the estate. They sold all of that. And... Um, and they also sold the Biltmore Village. So that's where the McDonald's is. The really expensive oh, one. Yeah. Okay. So this isn't, that's not the main house. It's like down from the main house that they owned and they allowed their employees to live there essentially or probably charged them. But interesting because like I thought the employees of these grand houses often lived in smaller quarters, but in the grand houses. I'm sure there were quite a few, but, like, they, it, there were servants' quarters. But, um, like, their family, if they had a family or anything like that, they would live in the village. Okay. Um, so, in 1924, ten years after Vanderbilt passed away, uh, Cornelia, his daughter, uh, married John Francis Amherst Cecil, four names, and they lived in the estate uh, full time. So it was no longer a holiday house. It was a full time house. And uh, Cornelia gave birth to her two sons in the same room that she was born in. So during the Great Depression, um, Cornelia and her husband opened the Biltmore to the public for tourists. It briefly closed during World War II, but it did reopen again. But um, Claudia and John were divorced in 1934, and Claudia left, even though it was her house. So she left to never return again. Did did John stay? And John stayed. He inherited the house until he he passed away in the house in 1954, 20 years later. Oh, that blows. Yeah. So Claudia left, and John inherited the house, until, and he stayed there, and he passed away in the house. So that means, um, I didn't hear if Cornelia's mom died in the house, but her dad did. Vanderbilt died in the house. And, um, that's the second person, John, dying in the house. 
And then the oldest son stayed there. He didn't get a name. So the oldest son didn't get a name. Um, he Wait, stayed. Did he? Cornelius. Did he, did he survive infancy? Yes. Yes. They both survived infancy. So it's not that he doesn't have a name. It's that we don't know the name. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's just, I was just picturing like the 20 year old man being like, okay, no name. <laughs> we didn't like you. But uh, their oldest son stayed there until 1954. Um, and he turned the house into a museum. But then the younger son, Will- William, <laughs> I I thought you were like looking at the door because Kari was coming home or something. But no, yeah. you're just chewing away from the mic. Yeah. Which I appreciate, but it's hilarious. If you can hear this, Zoe, later, because Zoe's going to do our editing, I, um... I apologize, <laughs> but also there's cheese puffs in front of me. <laughs> so, um, William, the younger son of Cornelia. Uh, he gets a name? Yes, he gets a name. <laughs> uh, he returned to the state in the late 1950s when it hit financial trouble. And then Claudia died in 1976, so he inherited it fully. Mm-hmm. So um, it's now in the name of William Cecil in the years 1976. Um, and I'm guessing his older brother just was like, you got it now and went away. That's interesting because like there was another William Cecil, but like he was just like a political guy in England in the Elizabethan times. Oh, just fun fact. The fun name, fact. The name. The name. The name. <laughs> And then in 1955, uh, William turned over the estate to his son, William Jr., who actually died in 2017, unless I'm getting the junior and the senior mixed up. It was very vague. I ran into the same issues with you. Um, with but, the Raymonds and the Williams. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so William Jr., I believe it's William Jr., and his, he died in 2017, and his wife, daughter, and son all share ownership. So, like, his wife owns this part, his daughter is the head chair of this part, and his son oversees this part. Okay. So, they split it up. So, that's who owns it now. What would you do if you owned the Biltmore? I'm not ready for that question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no. I, I, I mean, get really fucking lonely. <laughs> I think I would sell it. Okay. And donate some of the money to charity. Honestly, my gut reaction was to say make it, like, a homeless shelter. Are we good people, Zoe? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) But, so that's the history of it. It, um, Several people died in the house. uh, And, yeah. So, that's what the Biltmore Estate is. Now... It was made into a museum, like I mentioned, in the 1950s, and it's still a museum, so you can go in at any time. And my favorite part about it, now that I've been there, um, (laughs) is that they have mannequins, headless mannequins, wearing period clothing. They do. I I forgot about that. I'm remembering that. They have hundreds of them all throughout the mansion, which is said to give it, like, a really creepy feeling. Um, maybe, like, I-, I was always there, like, in the middle of the day. Mm. So, probably not the same vibe. Uh, fun fact. Can I give you a fun fact? Sure. The beds are really short. Because they were all short. You always, okay. you always forget that people were a lot shorter very recently. Right, yeah. So, it's just these grand beds, and I'm like, I'm five two and a half. <laughs> I would possibly need to scrunch up a bit. Yeah. Maybe not fully, but, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, they have short beds and headless mannequins everywhere. Ooh. (laughs) So let's get into the haunted shit. So. I thought we were calling it spooky shit. Okay, fine. Spooky shit. Um, We said the name of our podcast at the beginning, right? Haunted Hospitality. We always start with that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay, so like one of my biggest concerns, prelude here. Prelude? 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 No, I think maybe you're right. Prelude. Prelude or prelude? Prelude. Prelude? You were right. Okay. It just sounds weird. Maybe I'm not even using the right word. Segway here. I'm going to segue here. Yeah, that's probably and, the right word. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, like, my biggest concern, I love haunted hospitality, right? And it's too late to change it. Don't you dare cha- make me change it. The but, minute you said it, I was like, that's the name of the podcast. Yes. <laughs> but you know what HH stands for? Headless Horseman? Heil Hitler. 
oh shit yeah and like h8 and hh are constant like are used as nazi symbols like dog whistles you know okay so i'd like to go by our initials i'd like to take this moment to say we are not nazis I did not know we needed to clarify, but yes, we are not Nazis. We are not Nazis. And we're not going to refer to ourselves as HH. No, it's I'm... always going to be Haunted Hospitalities, and we're the Spooky Gingers. Yes. Mm, I. Yes, we are. Sorry, sometimes I get confused over, like, if we are spooky stories told by Southern Gingers or Southern stories told by Spooky Gingers, but I think we're Southern stories told by, by spooky, spooky Gingers. gingers. <laughs> yes, because I refuse to claim the Southern title. Which I did not know about. <laughs> I've told you this a million times. Well, the thing is, okay, but because you, you were talking about making a podcast about this, <laughs> I thought maybe you changed your mind. No, no, no. She's been here since she was four, people. She's, like, up the town we live in. She's lived here way longer than I have. Yes. Well, kind of. I lived in Lexington, and then I lived in Irmo, and so then I lived in Columbia. The it's the same place. <laughs> it is the same No, wait. First, it was, it was Lexington, then Irmo, and then it was Casey, and then it was Columbia. Zoe, this is the same place. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. <laughs> so, getting into the spooky shit. Yeah. Um, at the Biltmore. I put hotel for some reason. Haunted hospitality. Woo! I was kind of worried people would think we were about hotels. Did I say in the first podcast? I don't know. I don't think so. I'm kind of worried people are going to think we're about hospitals. What could possibly... Hospital. Hospital. You don't talk about (laughs) hospitals with hospitality. Hospital. Nobody (laughs) thinks... We're Southern. (laughs) If we talk about a hospital or a hotel, it's because we choose to. Okay. And it's a pun on Southern hospitality. Yeah. Yes. And we couldn't do Southern Hostility because that's a band. No, it's an album. To be honest, I like this better. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I like the alliteration. Except for the HH part. Except for the HH that part. That was unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Anyway, spooky shit. Yeah, yeah, what about the Billboard? What's spooky? <laughs> um, so, it, there's the traditional, like, cold spots, um, apparitions, uh, sensations of being pushed down the stairs, you know, traditional. Wait, are, um, are people, is people actually pushed down the stairs? Like, they, they feel like somebody, so they feel like somebody's, like, pushing them down the stairs. Like, nobody's fallen down the stairs, but they feel like somebody's, like, pushing them. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, for some reason, the stairs are, like, a hot spot. Like, they, apparitions appear a lot on the stairs, and I have a feeling, like, it's because... There's this theory, and I'm going on another segue, but, um, <laughs> I like segues. Anyway, um, like the motor, I the know, motor. I know, I'm trying not to get us on, like, a third segue on top of the second segue, so I was going to say something, and then I decided not to. <laughs> anyway, um, so these, like, in-between zones, I don't know if you, there's this weird feeling in in-between zones, so one of these in-between zones would be, like, um, uh what are rest stops on the side of the highway like there's just a weird Mm. atmosphere there right yeah because it's an in-between zone or like a parking lot at 3 a.m where there's no other cars right so yeah so it's like an in-between zone where you feel alone right um so i still stairs are also an in-between zone and a lot of people like have this thought process where because it's stairs it's an in-between zone between downstairs and upstairs it's also an in-between zone between our realm of being and the ghost's realm of being Hmm. yeah so stairs if you like there's a lot i've heard a lot of horror stories or spooky stories or whatever that um stairs are like really popular for ghosts and these ghosts in particular seem to be at least a little bit malicious if they're trying to push people down the stairs. Yeah, but honestly, if I was a ghost and I was having to walk up and down stairs all day yeah. and I happen to see somebody, I'm like, I wonder if they can feel me. <laughs> cool. Like, you know, like I would totally push someone down the stairs if I was a ghost. Nice. Yes. Um, I think, <laughs> you know, that's a different segue for another time. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Anyway, so yes, uh, I'm still in the first bullet point. <laughs> <laughs> so apparitions, uh, senses of being pushed, and strange smells suggest like um, like cigars. 
they can smell cigars, but the entire campus or estate or whatever you want to call it is smoke free. Okay. So you can smell like old timey cigars. So also people often feel like they're being followed or watched. Um, and the ghosts that are spotted on the stairs going up or down, but are not like distinct. It's not like you can look at them and be like, oh, that's a woman in a 1920s dress going up the stairs. It's like, I see a figure going up the stairs. To be honest, I feel like that's more likely how ghosts would actually be Right. Seen because, I mean, like... Imagine- Unless you have a personal tie or they're a very strong ghost. And then how do you get between it? How do you get to be a strong ghost versus a weak ghost? I think I want to go back into memories. Mm-hmm. Like, the more people that know who you are the better you'll be seen. Okay. Interesting. But that's my theory. You know what I really think I need to do? I think I just need to, like, get a book from the library about, like, theories of ghosts. Maybe that'd be a good topic. That would be a good topic. Okay, cool. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) What bullet point are you on now? Uh, five? (laughs) Oh, you went down a couple. Okay, good. Um, so... Oh, there's 200 rooms in the house, by the way. Um, and that's where the headless mannequins dressed up in old clothing are in the 200 rooms of the house. So uh, many report seeing George Vel- Vander- 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 Vanderbilt yeah, Vanderbilt in his library, reading his books or gazing upon his vast collection in a proud manner. That tracks. Yes, yes. So he was very proud of his book collection because I think he would literally steal it from people, but, like, he's rich, so he's not stealing it, you know? Um, So I never, I didn't read anything that said he would steal it, but they were like, he collected it from a variety of sources. And also, I don't like the guy, so. Um. (laughs) But I mean, okay, to be honest, like, if you have, I, I probably spend more time looking at my bookshelf and being proud of my bookshelf than I do actually reading from my bookshelf. That's, Maybe I shouldn't have admitted that. <laughs> <laughs> That's something, all right. But, um, so, apparently he was antisocial, mm-hmm. um, and he would often retreat into his library, uh, whenever there was, like, whenever he just got tired of the party. And also, affer- apparently, he was afraid of storms. So, um, he would often go to the library to read or to look at his books, um, Did whenever... I don't know. Maybe. Like, I do a lot of these things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, whenever he saw a storm approaching, and so now you can see a shadowy figure in the library that looks like it could be George Vanderbilt, um, especially when it's storming. Mm. Yeah. But um, so people often report hearing a woman whispering George in the library, mm. and it's thought to be his wife alerting him that there are guests in the house. So her, she's just going, George, George. <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, so uh, also the parties that I mentioned, um, workers and visitors often report hearing clinking glasses, laughter and music in the halls. But when they go to like where they think the music is coming from, yeah. like the room's completely dead and silent. Oh, and so this is the best part. In the basement kitchen, people report hearing and smelling and seeing staff cooking in the basement kitchen, right? Uh-huh. But there, that kitchen isn't in use anymore. Okay. So these are an entire ghost staff. Imagine being a ghost, Zoe. And having to work. And having to work still. I know, I hate it. But, yeah, so... Ain't no rest. So there's an indoor swimming pool in the basement, and people will feel uneasiness and terror next to the pool. Mm -hmm. Um, Guests feel the presence of someone who has potentially drowned in the pool during one of the parties, and you can also hear splashing even though the pool is kept empty. I couldn't find any stories of anybody drowning in the pool, though, so... Mm-hmm. If it happened, it was hush hush. Which I can see that. Though. I can see it, especially something I'm gonna tell you in a couple minutes. So I'm oh, waiting with bated breath. There's a lot that's kept hush hush around this. So when I first started reading, okay, actually, let me tell you one more bullet point, and then I'll get into that. Okay. So the last part, um, some report you're gonna get sad at this. Oh, seeing a headless orange cat. Oh. 
Aww. walking around despite no records of who the cat belonged to. But it's just a headless orange cat that walks around the building and it'll like brush up against you and everything. And like people will feel the brush of a cat and look down and either see nothing. Well, they'll see nothing and then or they'll be like walking and they'll see a headless orange cat just walking in the distance. Okay, imagine what a headless cat looks like. It's just all shoulders and legs and torso. Yeah. Which I guess is what a headless anything looks like, but like... I don't know, just something about, it's, it would be completely flat across the top. Would it be, or would there be, like, bits and guck sticking out? Well, it doesn't mention that. No, it didn't. But, I mean, I got a lot of this information so that I've told you so far from Wikipedia and um, onlyinyourstate.com. Uh, so it was, yeah. like, a tourist thing, and I don't think a tourist site would be, like, and the cat is spewing blood and guts. Yay! What if, like, it brushes up against you and you just look down and there's a headless cat that leaves, like, a mark of blood on <laughs> No, thank you. you know, I'm gonna get really freaked out when my orange cat brushes up against me. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so all of what I've said so far is, like, information that I was able to easily find. Um, like I said, it was in, uh, onlyinyourstate.com and I felt like that wasn't juicy enough. Yeah. Like, just that. It's just, like cool awesome moving on like Mm -hmm. that's not enough for a full episode like we're only at come on we're only at 40 minutes in recording okay maybe Maybe it is enough enough. (laughs) but i wanted to get juicier okay so i decided to shot in the dark uh google murder at biltmore history i got two very juicy stories give me the juice (laughs) so uh, the one is a true crime story and one is a ghost story. Okay. So, starting so back way back back to where Biltmore Estate was being built. Okay. So, uh, this is at the Forestry Compound, previously known as the Biltmore Forestry School, and a forestry school that I can barely pronounce is uh, exactly what it sounds like. It's a school to learn about trees and forests. No. Yeah. <laughs> so there's this guy. Um, I love his last name. I don't think I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I'm going to pronounce it this way. Um, Carl A. Schneck. Um, uh, it might be Schink. Schneck. Can you uh, S-C-H-E-N-C-K. Schneck. Schink. 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 Wait, is there an Wait, where's the N? E-N. Schink. Well, I'm going to say Schneck. Okay. <laughs> Sh- Sh- Shank? 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 Anyway. Shank. <laughs> Sh- shank? As in stabbing someone? Shank. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Carl A. Shank was one of the Biltmore Estate foresters. His wealth of... And... Uh, oh, excuse me. His wealth of knowledge spread around the town um, and locals apparently were obsessed with his forestry skills and they really wanted to learn about his forestry skills i guess people were like really bored yeah (laughs) so they uh with the permission of vanderbilt um well actually with vanderbilt himself he uh built the biltmore forestry school in an abandoned farmhouse. So this is on the Biltmore estate, but it's outside of the mansion. So there's like walls around the mansion and this is outside those walls. Okay. So um, it was opened in 1898. It was the first U.S. forestry school. Yes, there were more. Um, well, no, I mean, it, it makes sense that there's more. Right. I was just interested in the villagers' obsession with his forestry skills. Right. And so uh, Schenck was fired by Van- Vanderbilt as a forester of the estate in 1909 after Schenck claimed that Vanderbilt had not paid him. Schenck was the teacher and the forester, and so he was fired as the forester because he said Van- Vanderbilt wasn't paying him for his work as a forester. But he remained as a teacher. Was he still getting paid to be a teacher? I'm guessing so, yeah. But there was, like, a huge hubbub, um, and uh, people claimed that Schenck 
vowed to get his revenge after the loss of his position, and that his spirit still wanders the ground looking for that revenge. Okay. But the Forestry School was actually closed in 1913, and after it was closed, the place became known as a whorehouse. Oh, okay. So, um, it started off because it's a fairly secluded area, um, because it was in the middle of a forest, because it was a forestry school. And, um, so people started going, sneaking off there to have sex, but, um, it became a brothel, okay. essentially. So a bunch of, uh, prostitutes would stay there and hang out. And their what uh, this website called them her- Johns would come and visit. Yeah, so it was a whorehouse, and uh, it was unclear if Vanderbilt knew it existed. Some places claimed that he frequented there, and others said that he didn't know. I feel like he would probably know, and so the fact that he probably didn't do anything about it probably meant that he might have frequented it. Maybe, but um, so in. 1920s oh in the 1920s one of the prostitutes was actually murdered by her client and um those who are so you're it's not open to the public but of course people go anyway and um people who go onto the grounds claim to hear her singing so you can hear a woman singing throughout the whorehouse there were also secret hangings that would take place in this area uh up until the 1950s Hangings. Hangings. Um, so some claim that Schneck was hanged there. Hung. Hanged. Hung. Hanged. Men are hanged. Meat is hung. Um, but some say he was hanged there, but there's no reason for him to be hanged. I mean, given the time period, yeah. I'm guessing it might have been a lot of lynchings. Yeah. Um, just, but I couldn't find many details about who was killed there or not. Um, but, I mean, it's a hanging, and it was all the way up to the 1950s, and it's in a southern area, and I'm sure there was a large black population, because there's no way the Biltmore Estate was founded without enslaved people. Wait, when was it built again? The 1890-something. Mm, yeah, uh, it was... 1889, sla- excuse me. Slavery was abolished by that point. Oh, okay. Well... That's my U.S. history and knowledge. <laughs> but anyway, but hangings, you know, strange yeah, fruit. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's a lot of phenomena, like ghost phenomena, 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 sorry, I probably can't legally do that. Phenomena, Yeah, phenomena. <laughs> um, so you can see lights turning on and off in random windows, despite there being no electricity in that place. Oh, um, so if, like candles lit. No, it looks like electric lights. There's no electricity. It's ghost phenomena. Phenomena. (laughs) Um, But people driving by would see things in the windows. And then uh, doors will open and close by themselves, uh, according to people who venture inside illegally. And uh, the building is very cold even in the summer. They're talking 40 degrees Fahrenheit even in the summer in North Carolina. Um, and they will see shadowy figures moving around and guests will feel, uh, presences leading to them fleeing in terror. And, uh, one specific visitor claimed to see a tightened noose hanging from one of the rafters. And so he ran downstairs and found a toilet filled with blood. Wait, (laughs) I'm sorry. Okay, so... In the rafters, he runs downstairs. Now, we already mentioned that stairs are like this space. Yes, yes. He runs downstairs, finds a toilet filled with blood. That feels like one unlucky guy with two different hauntings going yes, on. Yes, yes. So that's the forestry area. Um, lots of ghosts walking around there. Okay. So, But it's illegal to visit, so there's like, less information on it. So... For legal reasons, that is a joke. For legal reasons, that is a joke. <laughs> um, so this next one, I didn't believe. This is the true crime part. I didn't believe this existed. Okay. Because I couldn't find any information on it from a credible source. I found one 
um, there's this Facebook called uh, Facebook Cut Down. I'm sorry, it's a, a Facebook page, and it's called Cut Down the Murders at the Biltmore State in 1922. I tried my darndest. So this Facebook page posted, like, screenshots of, um, what's that thing called where you can, the microfilm? I don't know what you're talking about. You can go to libraries. They've, like, saved all these old newspapers oh. in tiny versions. Yeah, I think that is what it's called. And, like, you can look through a machine to read them. Yeah. So he has screenshots of microfilm of a lot of, uh, like, snippets of a news story. And um, it, it's very confusing to follow. And I couldn't really tell what was happening. However, uh, I could pick out a few names. And so I was able to Google, like, the death of this person, the death of this person. And I was able to actually find a poorly translated, not translated as in from one language to another, but from a newspaper clipping to text that you can copy and paste on the internet. Yeah. Um, Tr- uh, transcribed. Transcribed, yeah. Um, post. And so it was like this entire newspaper and it was like a very long single column, no bigger than two inches on the screen. And it had typos, you name it. So um, I apologize if it seems a little like out of order so basically what happens is what happened was um so also before i say this they call them boys there's five boys that they're talking about i get ages on two of them one's 24 and the other one's like 21 20 exactly so these aren't boys these are these are grown men these are not boys, but everybody calls them boys because getting they're real, the victims. Getting real Ryan Lochte vibes. Do you remember that? No. Okay, it's like this 30-year-old man who, like, he, he's an Olympic swimmer. And while they were in, I think it was um, Rio de Janeiro, uh-huh. uh, he and some of his friends, like, robbed a gas station or something like that. I might be getting it wrong, disclaimer. Um, and so everybody was like, this young man, this boy. And everybody's like, he's 30. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the shooting takes place in the spring of 1922, a few hundred yards south of the gate to the Bill Morton estate around 11 at night. Okay. So, um, five boys, there's a lot of names, uh, Prince Sumner, Fletcher Frady, Carl Murray, Emery Lance. That's a cool name. And Lawrence West. That's also a cool name. Uh, those five were near the gates when Walter Brooks, who was a Biltmore guard, and Jim Taylor, who was a random person? I don't know. Um, you always need one random person in a story. <laughs> they approached the boys to find out what they were doing. Okay. What, wait, when was this again? Sorry. 1922. 1922. Okay. Locked in. Um, so one of the boys yelled, we're going to beat the hell out of you. We're going to take this place. And then, the yeah, I'm guessing. Okay. And then Walter Brooks, the guard, uh, then shot at the boys. Okay. Shooting wildly. Um, Murray and Frady, two of the boys, ran into a thick patch of woods nearby while Sumner screamed as he dragged himself after them. Uh, he later waved down a bus who took him to the hospital because he was shot. Then the the other two boys who didn't get away, Lawrence West and Emery Lance, they were both shot dead. Oh my gosh. West was shot in the forehead and Lance was shot through the back. And neither of them had guns on their body. So, like, was there a gun brandished by this group? I'm about to get into more details. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'll stop and I'm, this These are the facts and then I'm going to tell you what the boys said and then what the guard said. Gotcha. Yeah. Um... So, witnesses report that Sumner and Brooks, aka one of the boys and the guard, had a heated argument where one of the boys, Sumner, accused Brooks, the guard, of killing his dogs. Okay. And this happened prior to this um, shootout. Um, And then when the police showed up, they found whiskey in the boy's car. Okay. Uh, But all the boys claimed that they were not drinking. So, the boy, this is the boy's story. They claimed that they had met in town 
um, because Murray and Lance were going to fix the car. And then they went to Biltmore for supper. Um, but the headlight went out on the way there, so they got out of the car for Frady to fix it when the guard Brooks and Taylor showed up. Uh, Frady claimed to hear the argument where Sumner told Brooks to put the boy Sumner told Brooks the guard to put down his gun so that they could fist fight because Sumner believed that he could beat Brooks in a fair fight. Um, then Brooks had Taylor, the random guy, check Sumner to cl- make sure he didn't have a weapon on him. And then when Taylor cleared Sumner, Brooks backed out, like backed away. And then just started shooting randomly. Mm -hmm. And then um, Frady took off the witness. And he said when he ran, he heard Brooks say, I will kill them all. Okay. Okay. And then Brooks, the guard, his side of the story was that uh, he came across them during his rounds because they were hollering and cursing like a drunken crowd. He asked them to leave after showing his badge. And he asked them why they were there. But Sumner, the boy, refused to answer or leave. Brooks said that Sumner asked for a fist fight, but Brooks said there was no need for that. He asked them to get in their car and leave. Um, Lance also wanted to fight (laughs) another boy, um, and Brooks told him to leave again. Uh, They tried to surround him, so he backed up and told them to leave. They said they would, and then this is where the newspaper got super confusing. They turned left instead of right, so Brooks fired. I have no... Like, they weren't in the car yet. So the the newspaper said they turned left instead of right, so Brooks fired. So my assumption is that instead of, like, get going to get into the car, uh-huh. they walk, kind of walked a little bit further away from the car. And then he just starts... And so, he, like, he thought they were going to, like, gang up on him or something. So he started shooting at them in self-defense. What does the witness... Did the witness who was with the... Yes. Okay. So Taylor says that Lance had a weapon, but he didn't use it. They said he had an iron, but I don't think he had a, like, clothes straining iron with him. I think it was, like... An iron bar. Yeah, vernacular for that. Um, and he did, but he didn't use it. And he also saw that Sumner threw something into the woods before the shooting. Taylor said that he didn't see much because it was dark and he wasn't like up front like Brooks was. Taylor was very useless. (laughs) Um, so a year later, Prince Sumner was in critical condition because he was shot. Um, both those two boys were dead. Uh, Felcher Frady was being held for questioning. Wait, this is a year later, you said? Yes, a year later. Yeah. The guy's still in critical condition? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Frady is the one who was being held for, uh, inter- not interrogation, but questioning, like, to get his information. Um, and then uh, Carl Murray just disappeared. One of the boys just disappeared. He never got was seen again. He just, so that, he just disappeared into the woods. That makes me think he probably died. Or saw something. Or he, like, because it, it, the whole thing was, did the boys start the fight with guns? Because uh, Taylor did say that Sumner threw something into the woods. And but if you so, threw something into the woods, it means you're not gonna use it. Well, this was after they were shot at. So, like, okay. he was shot at, and so while he was running away, he threw it into the woods. And so, like, if you believe Brooks was just defending himself, mm-hmm. these are five rotten, drunk kids, um, all above their 20. <laughs> 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 um, and they were trying to fight him. They were being disruptive. They were going to kill him, so he had to shoot into self-defense. Uh-huh. If you believe the boys... Excuse me. If you believe the boys' story, they were, oh, no, we had car trouble, and then Brooks came out of nowhere, and we were completely innocent, and he just shot us like a madman. So, I feel like the truth is somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, I do think that the boys were drunk and that they uh, probably were up to no good. 
up to no good sounds so like Harry 50s. Potter. Yeah, oh. <laughs> or Harry Potter. But um, I do think that they were up to no good. But I don't think they had guns on them. I think they were drunk in the morning to fight someone, mm-hmm. and so he shouldn't have shot them. I don't think they were like. Yeah, you don't just open fire. Yeah. So Brooks was actually locked in county jail pending an investigation. Oh, okay. And the reason I also bring it up is because the ghosts of the two that died are said to be in that area. Okay. Yeah. And it's really sad. Like, one of them, uh, the one who was shot in the forehead, his body was found, like, just kind of on the ground. Like, he was shot in the forehead. He was probably the, f- the first bullet probably killed him. He probably didn't have time to react. But the boy that was shot in the back, um, he was, like, found his body on the car as if he was trying to go, like, around the car to hide behind it. Oh, man. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, Prince Sumner, who was shot dra- and had to drag himself into the forest to get away. Um, and then held down a... He was still in the hospital. And then one of the boys just disappeared. <laughs> and Freddy was being held for questioning. Man. Yeah. That is an intense story. Yeah. But that is the ghosts at the Bel- Biltmore Estate and the 1922. Oh, the thing about that story, I Googled everywhere to find this and I found several links, but every single one of the links that I clicked, it said, sorry, doesn't exist. Sorry, doesn't exist. Sorry, this page has been moved to somewhere else. About this 1922 shooting. Yep. Sounds like somebody is trying to hide it. <laughs> So we're cracking cases here. Who's trying to hide this? <laughs> but yeah. So those are the ghosts of the Biltmore Estate. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Well, I, when I go to the Biltmore next, it will not be the same. It will not be. We should go at night. Can we? Is that a thing? I have no idea. There's probably ghost tours. Probably, yeah. All of these places have ghost tours. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's a thing now. Well, do you have anything to say before we sign off? I have to say this. What? Thank you for listening to our podcast today. If you liked this episode, please like and subscribe and review. And if you want to get in touch with us, please email us at hauntedhospitalitypodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you want to look at our show notes and see our sources or just give us a visit, you can find us at www dot haunted hospitality dot wordpress dot com you can also join us on instagram at haunted hospitality or twitter at haunted hosts we would love to see you there stay Stay spooky. spooky